Uh, my name is Paul Allen, and uh, I am a theologian at uh, Concordia University in, in Montreal. And uh, it's a, a privilege to be uh, here with you uh, today. Uh, so the, the rationale or reason for my involvement uh, in this uh, symposium, um, I'll speak a little bit about, uh, really just a little bit, for a few minutes after uh, lunch. Um, I want to uh, say, first of all, a very warm thank you to Wycliffe College for hosting this uh, symposium. You know, the early Greek uh, symposia were known essentially for being drinking parties. Um, and so while there will not be that level of frivolity today, I do foresee a certain convivium. And convivium being a, a Latin term that is roughly equivalent to the Greek word symposia. Meaning a coming together of minds that are alike in terms of there being shared interest and value, and yet uh, minds that differ in certain respects. So the theme of our symposium today, Creatures of God, Theological Anthropology in the Context of Evolution, a Catholic Evangelical Dialogue, is one of great importance to various church uh, traditions. And we've singled out uh, two of them, specifically the Catholic and the broadly evangelical uh, traditions. And so the focus is on the theme uh, therein of sin and uh, human creaturehood. Yep. That's okay. um, so the, the differences, uh, apart from the similarities of shared value and interest, the differences um, is of theological strategy of theological priority, perhaps. Evangelicals and Catholics, as well as other Christian traditions, think of human creaturehood with some significant distinctions. Where this becomes important, I think, is to resolve to some extent, um, you know, in light of the cultural shift occasioned by the advances in the biological theory of evolution, this is, this is a challenge for Christians of various traditions to come and strategize, to think together. So today we'll explore how theological strategies can be more coherent in the context of one scientifically forceful understanding of nature, namely the theory of evolution, which touches very deeply on human nature. But I don't think we need to be overly simplistic, certainly not pessimistic, in our sense of what evolution implies or on what it Im might, might impose on believers. Yes, the debates, interminable, arguably dull and rancorous over the meaning of the Genesis text and its coherence with Darwin's theory of evolution, this is all very well known. What is perhaps less well known are the new advances, especially in theoretical biology, which promise to place Darwin's theory in an even more majestic, if I may use that word, a more majestic context of understanding. Primatologists such as Franz de Waal and the well-known entomologist E.O. Wilson have made precise and strong arguments for thinking of the significance of cooperation in animal species, overturning, perhaps, a view of exclusive competition that is fed by the narratives of meaninglessness adopted by various atheist apologists for evolution. Another example, paleontologist Simon Conway Morris has made a fascinating case for thinking through the mathematical order of evolutionary processes and he has hypothesized a set limit of morphological types within which evolution, according to him, must be, needs to be constrained. So, in other words, evolution is not so random uh, a process after all. All of which is to say that evolution is not the monolithic theory, even on the friendliest of readings that some people of faith might take it to be. What then are the opportunities that exist for a creative as opposed to a defensive reading of evolution or of our own tradition in the face of evolution? 
in order to come up with and to reformulate a faithful understanding of human nature. So that's by way of setting up the background a little bit. And today we are privileged to have among us a wealth of persons whose teaching and scholarly experience in this area is at the cutting edge of Christian reappraisals of especially the scientific, but also the philosophical, and indeed the theological insights that can help us attain a more adequate view of human nature. A view of human nature that is more adequate to the needs of the 21st century church, the 21st century academy, and our 21st century world. So this morning as you came in, uh, I hope that you both, that you picked up both a, a copy of the schedule for today. We're running just a few minutes behind, but that's, uh, that won't be a, a problem. Um, we will be uh, having uh, breaks both after the first lecture and then after an afternoon panel presentation uh, for which there will be uh, drinks and uh, at least uh, one of them with some snacks. There will also be lunch that is provided with the symposium today. This symposium would not be possible without the support uh, through, through my grant, but from the, uh, it is from the, through the Biologos Foundation. And you have, I hope, uh, picked up a brochure that, uh, that tells you a little bit about BioLogos. I will say a few more words about that um, after, just briefly after uh, lunch. The BioLogos Foundation received a uh, large grant from the John Templeton Foundation um, in 2012, uh, specifically to run programming uh, for uh, the Christian church, uh, particularly the evangelical churches uh, globally, um, with most of the, uh, the grants uh, obtained by academics in North America and in Europe. Okay, well, I'll say a little bit more about that later. Let us not uh, delay and move on to the first of our two lectures of this symposium. Uh, the symposium will be bookended by uh, two lectures, the first of which will come uh, this morning from Dr. Gerald McKenney, who comes to us from the University of Notre Dame. And Dr. McKenney's lecture will be entitled Bio, uh, Biotechnology, pardon me, Biotechnology Evolution and the Normative Status of Human Nature. Uh, as you can see from Dr. McKenney's brief uh, biography in the schedule, he is Walter Professor of Theology at the University of Notre Dame and teaches and writes in theological ethics, biomedical ethics, and the ethics of biotechnology. I won't read or go over the entire uh, uh, summary there, but you see that uh, he is coming out with a new book uh, this coming year, Darwin in the 21st Century, Nature, Humanity, and God. So we'll begin with our lecture from Kenny, after which we'll have some time uh, for questions and discussion. I turn over the, uh, the lectern now to Dr. McKinney. Welcome to Toronto. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Allen, for that uh, generous introduction, and thank you to all of you for being here. Um, I, uh, my, my voice is, <coughs> I hope, um, uh, it is, is clear to everyone. It's, I've been uh, fighting competitions for two weeks now. Um, so my voice isn't quite normal, but I think I'll be able to get through this. Um, is this working? Okay, so people can hear. Great. In the time allotted to me, I want to consider a normative implication of the acceptance of evolutionary biology into our conception of created order. The question I ask is this. If we concede that human biological nature, as it now is, has evolved through evolutionary processes operating over many eons, do we have any principled grounds for opposing the intentional alteration of human biological nature through biotechnology? Christians have traditionally claimed that the world as God created it is good, and that its goodness consists at least in part in its order which is also the ground of human moral action. The point is not just that God created the world, but that the world God created exhibits order. And that order is both essential to the notion of the world as God's creation 
and the standard of human moral action. Created order was traditionally conceived as both generic and teleological, that is, as consisting in both kinds and ends. Until recently, the claim that the living world is ordered in these ways was thought to be incompatible with evolutionary biology, especially in the form it took in the wake of the modern evolutionary synthesis. But in recent years, neo-Aristotelian theories have made a partial comeback in the philosophy of biology. While others have found ways to talk about creation without either relying on or dismissing Darwinian talking about uh, created order without either relying on or dismissing Darwinian evolution, is Oliver O'Donovan, a prominent evangelical theologian, who has demonstrated how a broadly Platonistic, uh, Platonist Augustinian conception of created order, grounded in Genesis 1, can accommodate cosmological and evolutionary accounts of how things that are ordered in that way came into existence. Gene Porter, a prominent Catholic theologian, has demonstrated how an Aristotelian Thomist conception of the natural world as ordered by formal and final causes can accommodate an evolutionary account of how the things that are so ordered came about. Of course, O'Donovan does not speak for all evangelicals or Porter for all Catholics, but their respective achievements demonstrate that evangelicals and Catholics may maintain their most characteristic claims about created order in their most robust forms without denying evolutionary biology. My interest is therefore not in whether evangelicals and Catholics can accept evolutionary biology without relinquishing their most fundamental claims about creation. O'Donovan and Porter have demonstrated that they can. Rather, my interest is in, in whether acceptance of evolutionary biology as compatible with created order commits them to accepting the permissibility of biotechnological alteration of nature, including human nature. If the change in variation in human functions and traits that are due to evolutionary processes is compatible with the normative conception of order, then wouldn't the change in variation introduced by biotechnology also be compatible with it? This is the question I want to pose. We can sharpen this question by turning for a moment to the position of James Peterson of McMaster University. Peterson argues that Genesis 1 depicts a divine creative act that occurs over time and enlists creaturely agencies in its work. Such a view, he thinks, is consistent with what we know from evolutionary biology and other sciences Namely, that the, world is const the natural world is constantly changing and that creatures, especially humans, are significant agents of that change. As Peterson puts it, quote, God sovereignly chooses to create over time and has designed us and our world to do the same, end quote. It follows for him that, quote, the present state of nature cannot tell us what it will be or, more importantly, what it should be, end quote. On these grounds, Peterson denies that normative status atta uh, attaches to the order of the natural world as it now is. And one more quote, even if one could clearly discern a natural order, why consider that a pure expression of God's will, end quote. In sum, for Peterson, our knowledge that nature, including human nature, is constantly changing due to evolutionary and environmental processes, as well as human activity, supports the notion that God intends to include creaturely agency in the divine work of creation and to carry out that work over time. Biotechnological alteration of human nature is, for Peterson, one way in which humans participate in God's creative act. Now I can put my question this way. Can one accept, as Peterson does, the claim that nature as it now is, including human nature, is the product of evolutionary, environmental, and anthropogenic causes without endorsing, in principle, biotechnological alteration of human nature? In my view, the strongest grounds for an affirmative answer to that question are to be found in O'Donovan's Platonist Augustinian conception of created order, 
and Porter's Aristotelian Thomist one. However, I am going to argue that their positions fail to rule out biotechnological alteration of human nature, which must be opposed on other grounds. Oliver O'Donovan. Like most evangelicals, O'Donovan derives his notion of creation from scripture with a characteristic emphasis on the creation narratives of Genesis 1 and 2. The first biblical creation narrative, as you all know, pronounces creation to be both good, Genesis 1.31, God saw everything he had made, and indeed it was very good, and complete, Genesis 2.1, thus the heavens and the earth were finished in all their multitude. It seems plausible to argue on these grounds that respect for creation as God's work requires us to leave it as it is. If it is both finished and good, what could justify an action that intends to alter it? O'Donovan is justifiably cited as a proponent of this view. That which most distinguishes the concept of creation, he asserts, is that it is complete. And he goes on to argue that human action must respect creation as complete. But in what sense is creation a complete or finished work? O'Donovan does not argue that creation is finished in the sense that it is inert or unchanging, nor is it finished in the sense that created things were brought into existence by an instantaneous divine act. When O'Donovan refers to creation as a finished act of God, he means that whatever processes have brought created things about, these things constitute an ordered whole. It is this order that explains what has come about in time and not vice versa. In O'Donovan's words, creation as a completed design is presupposed by any movement in time. O'Donovan therefore denies that we can arrive at a, con at a conception of creation by For O'Donovan to say that the world is an ordered whole is to say that it consists in generic and teleological relations. Drawing in part on Genesis 1 and 2, he argues that created things belong to kinds, as for example, individual human beings belong to the human kind, and are ordered to ends, as for example, vegetables are ordered to humans and other animals for food. These relations are highly complex. The vegetables that are teleologically ordered to, humans for food, or to animals for food are generically ordered to one another as vegetables, just as humans who exist in generic equality with one another are teleologically ordered to God. Now, how is created order so understood related to scientific knowledge of the world? For O'Donovan, biological knowledge ignores the obvious ordering of vegetables to humans and non-human and human and non-human animals for food in order to focus on previously unnoticed generic orderings, such as the one in which hum, uh, animals and vegetables alike are subject to genetic and evolutionary processes. Similarly, science and technology may ignore the obvious ordering of vegetables to discover previously unknown orderings, uh, the unordering of vegetables to humans for medicine, for example. 
In both cases, the relevant knowledge is attained only by methodologically abstracting from the generic and teleological orders in which vegetables stand and treating them as if they were ordered only by natural causes, such as those of genetics and evolution. This procedure is perfectly legitimate, O'Donovan thinks, but problems arise when science and technology assume that the kinds and ends discovered by science and invented by technology are the only kinds and ends there are, so that created order appears as the product of scientific and technological ingenuity. Order in this case is what the human mind and will impose on the world, and this assumption is what worries O'Donovan most. The fundamental question for him is whether generic and teleological relations are the finished work of God, as Genesis 2.1 suggests, or are merely imposed on the world by us. In his words, we must understand creation not merely as the raw material out of which the world as we know it is composed, but as the order and coherence in which it is composed. And the fundamental decision faced by the human agent is the decision between realism and nominalism, whether to regard this order and coherence as real or as merely imposed by the human mind and will, and thus available to be reordered at will. This sharp distinction between creation as an order that demands respect and as raw material available to the human will to form corresponds to a broadly Aristotelian distinction between two kinds of action, namely acting properly understood, which respects generic and teleological orders as created by God, and making, which views created things as unformed material available for human fashioning. It should now be clear how O'Donovan is able to affirm that creation is a finished work of God, which human action must respect as such, while also accommodating cosmological and evolutionary accounts of the temporal origins of created things and scientific accounts of their nature. I now want to consider some implications of his position. Recall that for O'Donovan, it is created order that explains the existence and nature of things that come into existence through cosmological, evolutionary, and historical processes, and not vice versa. That any things have come into existence through these temporal processes, and that they exist in the orders in which they do, is explained by God's creative act, and not by those processes, which presuppose rather than explain the order God has created. O'Donovan accepts that humans, vegetables, and the institution of marriage all came into existence through temporal processes and all may pass out of existence. But what they are, their nature, is determined by the generic and teleological orders in which they exist. What this means is that the things that are ordered are temporal and do not share the unchanging and finished character of the orders in which they exist. Moreover, the generic and teleological relations in which things exist are intrinsic to those things. For O'Donovan, things like humans and vegetables are what they are, less by virtue of forms and ends that inherit in those things than by virtue of their generic and teleological relations to things other than themselves. He is a Platonist or a Stoic more than he is an Aristotelian. These points are important because they allow O'Donovan to accommodate temporal processes such as evolution while maintaining the unchanging and finished character of creation, which he thinks Genesis 1 to 2 requires. However, these same points appear to accommodate technological alterations of things so long as these alterations fall under the heading of acting, which respects kinds and ends as they are, and not making, which assumes kinds and ends may be imposed by our will. For example, vegetables are ordered to humans and other animals for food, and to alter the properties of vegetables so that they are more adequate to that purpose would seem to be not only consistent with respect for the teleological order in which they exist, but expressive of that respect. On the same grounds, it would seem to be possible to alter human functions and traits 
at least to some degree, without altering the generic ordering of humans to one another or their teleological ordering to God. So long as such alterations could be understood as presupposing the generic order in which humans exist, just as evolutionary processes presuppose that generic order, they would not appear to violate created order. In fact, however, O'Donovan argues against this implication in the case of humans, but I want to show how his argument is questionable. In the context of reproductive technology, O'Donovan famously distinguishes begetting children from making them. And the distinction draws directly on features of gener the generic ordering of humans to one another. What we beget is like us and equal to us. What we make is unlike us and at our disposal. Making other humans therefore violates the generic relation to other, uh, to, uh, of humans to one another as human. O'Donovan does not say which interventions turn procreation into making, but he implies that any intervention that is not therapeutic would count as making. If so, any act in, aimed at enhancing biological functions and traits would be considered making and would be a violation of the generic order in which uh, parents and children exist as human beings. This is almost certainly O'Donovan's position, but the matter is not so simple. O'Donovan stresses that in any situation of choice, created order is present in a multiplicity of generic and teleological orders. We can easily identify several generic and teleological relations that are present in procreation in addition to the generic relation in which parents and, ch and children exist as fellow human beings. Although qua human, parents and children are related to one another generically, but not teleologically, parent and child are themselves generic orders, and there are complex teleological relations between them. For example, children are under the authority of their parents, but parenthood is for the sake of the child's good, and so on. Right action requires discerning how these different relations are ordered. Would an act in which parents attempt to form their child count as a violation of her generic identity as a human being, in which she exists as her parent's equal and does not exist for their purpose? Or alternatively, would such an act count as, the exist, uh, as an instance of the ordering of parenthood to the child's good? Surely this question arises frequently in the context of parental intervention into their growing child's environment. Why then should it not also arise in the context of intervention into the child's biological nature? In short, why should we not assume, uh, why should we assume that only the generic relation of parents to children as fellow human beings counts in the case of altering biological nature, and not also their generic and teleological relations as parents and children, and the responsibility, which is inherent in this relation, of parents to benefit their children. If on uh, these grounds, um, consideration, uh, consideration of these complex relations in which parenthood exists, uh, the distinction between make and, making and begetting collapses, we are left with the possibility of alterations of human nature that presuppose the generic order of humans in the same way evolutionary and other processes do. So I conclude by st stating that O'Donovan is not able to exclude the intentional alterations of human beings and he is not able to do so because they can be understood in the same terms as uh, the change that is due to evolutionary, um, to evolutionary biology. I turn now to Gene Porter. In many debates over biological enhancement, Normative status is claimed for human nature as the ground of human goods or rights. From a Christian perspective, the connection of goods and rights with human nature as created by God is attractive because it both supports the claim that creation is good, our creaturely nature is ordered to our flourishing and not merely indifferent or hostile to it, and it provides an intelligible ground for goods and rights. The latter are not merely inventions, but are related to our nature as God created it. 
There are various ways to formulate these points, but the most characteristic ways are broadly Aristotelian. They hold that when we speak of the nature of something, we refer to the characteristic or set of characteristics that make it what it is, its essence, while its good consists in its fulfillment as the kind of thing it is. The challenge that biotechnology poses for this Aristotelian kind of position is obvious. If human goods and rights are grounded in human nature, it seems reasonable to suppose that at least some goods and rights are dependent on preserving or respecting human functions and traits as they are in their present form, and to worry that biotechnological alteration of these functions and traits will undermine these goods and rights. However, the claim that biotechnological alteration of functions and traits imperils nature-dependent goods and rights must meet three objections. The first objection holds that there is no stable human nature for biotechnology to interrupt. Like all products of evolutionary and environmental processes, human functions and traits have always been in flux, and the change and variation introduced by biotechnology is no different in principle from that which is due to nature itself. The second objection holds that even if it is possible to arrive at a plausible concept of a stable human nature, any such concept must accommodate the considerable change and variation in human functions and traits which we actually observe. But if human goods and rights are not threatened by the change and variation in human functions and traits which we observe, change and variation that's due to evolutionary and environmental factors, as well as unintentional human activity, then there is no reason to worry that these goods or rights will be threatened by the variation and change that biotechnology introduces. Nature-dependent goods and rights already accommodate a lot of change and variation in nature. Why should we worry that they will not be able to accommodate a little more? The third objection is a somewhat different one. It holds that normative status properly attaches to the goods and rights themselves and not to the human nature on which they allegedly depend, so that it is justifiable in principle to alter human nature to protect or promote those goods and rights. If the goods or rights themselves that make, a, uh, it is the goods and rights themselves that make a claim on us, not human nature. We are obligated, according to this objection, to promote and protect these goods and rights. And there is nothing ethically at stake in the process that we may end up altering human functions and traits in the course of doing that. So let's begin with the first objection, that there is no stable human nature for biotechnology to interrupt. One interesting trend, uh, contemporary trend in the philosophy of biology, is the resurgence of Aristotelianism. In the case of human nature, Aristotelian theories classically held that human nature is defined by a characteristic, or more plausibly, a set of characteristics, which all humans, and at least in their distinctively human versions, only humans share. The Darwinian discovery that species are evolved products of contingent evolutionary processes is often thought to have invalidated the notion of unchanging essences shared by all humans and only humans. However, drawing on the work of recent Aristotelian philosophies of biology, Catholic moral theologian Jean Porter has argued that our concepts of species amount to more than mere generalizations about their diverse individual members and do not share the contingency of the process that, processes that have produced species. Even in a post-Darwinian context, she argues, we can explain traits or behaviors of an organism only if we know what kind of organism it is and can understand its traits or behaviors as characteristic of its kind. In Aristotelian terms, such explanations involve formal causes. Similarly, we can explain the development of organisms and debate whether a disputed member is one of them or not only by appealing to the notion of a fully formed or paradigmatic member of their kind, to which less developed organisms or organisms that exhibit anomalous traits may uh, approximate in varying degrees. 
In Aristotelian terms, such explanations involve final causes. What interests me is that Porter's conception of formal and final causes succeeds in combining metaphysical realism with change and variation. Her formal and final causes are real, not merely nominal. They are not mere constructs, but explain actual traits and behaviors of organisms as characteristics of kinds. At the same time, these causes are indeterminate in an important sense. For Porter, the defining characteristics of a species are neither necessary nor sufficient conditions for membership in that species. That is, membership of an individual organism in a species is neither forfeited for lack of any single characteristic nor guaranteed by possession of any single characteristic. A defense of Porter and her fellow neo-Aristotelians is well beyond my scope, but she has at least demonstrated that an Aristotelian Thomist conception of created order remains fully intelligible in a post-Darwinian world. However, Porter's success in showing how a stable human nature to which enduring human goods and rights attach is at least compatible with the change and variation in human functions and traits that result from in, uh, uh, um, evolutionary and environmental processes raises a question which brings us to the second objection. If human nature is stable enough to support enduring goods and rights in spite of the change and variation nature have introduced, why wouldn't it be stable enough to support these goods and rights in spite of the biotechnological alteration of human functions and traits? The grounds on which Porter accommodates evolutionary and environmental change and variation appear to accommodate biotechnological change and variation as well. If human nature is already changing and variable, and that without threat to nature-dependent goods and rights, then why should we worry that the change and variation introduced by biotechnology will threaten those goods and rights? The answer is that we need not worry because the natural characteristics on which the relevant goods and rights depend need not be rigidly fixed or invariable in order to support those goods and rights. The very point of Porter's formal and final causes is to show that in spite of its variability, human nature is sufficiently uniform to support the ascription of the same goods and rights to every human being. Of course, the accommodation of biotechnological alteration is not unlimited. At some point, quantitative differences in, say, cognitive or emotional functioning, or qualitative differences such as the elimination of a range of emotional responses, or entirely new cognitive functions, all of which are promised by uh, uh, proponents of biotechnology, could be great enough that the behaviors of the altered and unaltered would be best explained by referring them to distinct formal causes, and thus to distinct species. Nevertheless, it is safe to assume that the change and variation accommodated by Porter's forms is wide enough to encompass the bio biotechnological alterations that currently appear to be realistically achievable. Biotechnological alteration of human nature would have to go to rather extreme lengths to justify the worry that nature-dependent human goods and rights are imperiled by biotechnological alteration of human functions and traits. While it is plausible to hold that there is a stable human nature, it is not plausible to hold that biotechnology, at least in the foreseeable future, will disrupt it. We are now ready to consider the third objection, which holds that even if human goods or rights are dependent on human nature, normative status properly attaches to those goods and rights, and not to the human nature on which, at least for now, they depend. So that it is justifiable in principle to alter human nature if doing so would facilitate the protection or promotion of those goods or rights. Let us concede that certain goods, rights, are indeed dependent on human nature. Prior to any ability to alter our biological nature, we would have reason to be satisfied with these goods, even if we could imagine more attractive ones. But if we achieve the ability to alter our biological nature, it may no longer be necessary for us to rest satisfied 
with goods that are dependent on our unaltered nature. We may instead have the option of beginning to remake our nature in accordance with goods like much higher levels of cognitive ability, expanded perceptual capacities, a richer, more subtle range of emotions, or greatly increased physical strength or agility. Goods which, even if we recognize them as good for creatures with our nature, are unavailable to us in the current state of our nature. Under these circumstances, the defenders of the goods that are dependent on our unaltered nature will no longer be able to commend these goods to us simply on the grounds that they fulfill our nature or are more consonant with it than their alternatives are. Instead, they will have to decide whether normative status properly attaches to human nature in its current state or to the goods which at present may be dependent on our nature as it is, but which in their fullest versions may require the alteration of functions and traits. Are these goods goods because they are human or are they good because they are good? If the former is the case, that is nature dependent goods are goods because they are human, then an account of why normative status attaches to human nature as such and not simply as the ground of human goods is needed. If the latter is the case, so that it is the goods themselves and not their connection with human nature in its current state that we should value, then it appears that human nature poses no ethical barrier to promoting those goods, that is to realizing them in their fullest versions. Faced with this choice, bioethicists are overwhelmingly in favor of attributing normative status to the goods themselves rather than to the human nature on which they depend. In making normative evaluations, the argument goes, we can and should consider goods in abstraction from human nature and inquire whether human nature in its present form is adequate to them. And it is in principle justifiable to alter human functions and traits in order to make them more amenable to the good as we conceive it. This view, however, implies that our nature as it is is not adequate to the goods God intends for us. And that calls into question the goodness of creation and its completeness. So this is a problematic position, I think, for a Christian to hold. Nevertheless, there are two responses that are um, both plausible and have both been made by Christians who want to oppose biomedical or biotechnological enhancement. The first response argues that even if we concede that the goods biotechnology promises are worthy of choice and even superior to those our nature and our current state allows us to enjoy, it would be foolish to attempt to alter our nature in pursuit of these goods. The second response argues that the goods available to us in the present state of our biological nature are more choice worthy than whatever goods we stand to gain by altering or bypassing our nature. The most sophisticated version of the first response that even if these are superior goods, we should not pursue them, it would be unwise to do so, appeals to evolutionary biology, arguing that the alteration of human biological nature could upset the finely tuned relationship between human nature and the human good that is the result of the workings of evolutionary processes over many eons. Gordon Graham nicely articulates this concern, and um, I think it's worth quoting him at length here. The human genome, if human evolutionary biology is to be believed, is the outcome of many millions of years of selection and adaptation. This process has made the existing genome hugely well adapted to the human condition, the circumstances in which humans must not merely survive, but thrive. Now, the ambition of refashioning this genome more effectively must rest on the supposition that the accumulated results of a little less than 200 years of biological science will enable us to do better than indefinitely many years of evolution had, have done. What possible reason could we have to think this? To illustrate Graham's point, consider a plausible future scenario in which stem cell technology is capable of rebuilding vital organs such as hearts, lungs, livers, and kidneys so that deaths due to the failure of these uh, organs are averted, yet progress in slowing or reversing 
neurodegenerative conditions such as Alzheimer's disease lags behind. People now live much longer, but the added years only prolong their state of cognitive decline. Those such as Graham who appeal to this argument from evolutionary biology would not be surprised that it is difficult to calibrate our biotechnological advances in a way that benefits the whole organism. After all, the proportionality of the good of the human organism to its nature, for all its imperfection, took shape over many eons. It is foolish to think that we, with our limited knowledge and in such a short time, can improve on this record with a few alterations here and a few there. This response sounds plausible, but it is based on a misunderstanding of biological evolution. As anyone who has lived past the optimum age of reproduction might attest, evolutionary processes select for reproductive fitness, not for overall human well-being. Moreover, nearly the whole of human evolution occurred when humans lived under conditions that bear little resemblance to the conditions humans live under today. In short, evolutionary theory offers us no reason to accept the results of evolutionary processes as an ideal or even a tolerable state of affairs so far as the human good as a whole is concerned. To be sure, natural selection has conferred on us a high degree of adaptability to our physical environment, so evolutionary biology counsels us to exercise caution in altering functions and traits in accordance with our judgments about the good. And it is not clear that we have learned enough in 200 years to be confident that our intentional interventions will indeed promote and not threaten our overall good. But over its many eons, bio, uh, biological evolution has operated without any concern for our overall good, so we have no reason to assume that it is a more reliable means to the latter than biotechnology will be. This first response then, which holds that even if the goods dependent on an unaltered nature are superior, we would be unwise to pursue them, this response thus fails, rests on a, a, a misunderstanding of evolutionary biology. The only alternative that remains on this view of created order is the second response, which denies that the goods that biotechnological alteration of nature uh, make available to us are superior to the goods that are accessible to us in our nature as it now is. Even if biotechnology makes alternative goods available to us, this response asserts, we should reject them as inferior to the goods that are dependent on our biological nature as it is. Leon Cass, Martha Nussbaum, and others have offered versions of this argument, claiming that the vulnerabilities and limitations of our nature in its present state are the source of goods that are richer and deeper than those we stand to gain by altering our nature. However, this argument takes us into bioethics and is beyond the scope of this paper. So I conclude by briefly stating where this paper has brought us. The strongest arguments against biotechnological alteration of human nature appeal to a created order. If creation is both good and complete, or if our creaturely nature is ordered to our flourishing, then alteration of our nature appears to violate the created order. However, we have seen that created order is compatible with evolutionary, environmental, and anthropogenic changes to human nature. And if so, we've found that it is also compatible on the same grounds with at least a significant degree of biotechnological change. So if biotechnological alteration of human nature is to be opposed, it must be on grounds other than its alleged incompatibility with created order. Thank you. <laughs>